Hi everyone and welcome to today's online gathering. Today we'll be focusing on the character of God, how God knows us and loves us completely. Isn't it always amazing? It does always amaze me how God can do that, how he can take little old me and lavish such love, unconditional love over me, how he surrounds me with his presence each and every day and how he knows me intimately inside and out. You know, there are no conditions on God's love for us. You don't need to be super smart or super religious to be accepted by God. It's a gift. A gift is given all of us. He made us. The Bible says he knitted me in my mother's womb. Isn't that just mind blowing? And he loves us and he's so gracious towards us. That quote is from Psalm 139, which is today's reading. And also, he just makes so many promises in the Bible to us. So, you know, we are assured of that. Um, just a few things to pick out. He says that in Christ, we are completely accepted. We are extremely valuable to him and we are totally forgiven and we are eternally loved. That is God's truth. That is God's word. And he puts no conditions on that. He just asks that we open our hearts and receive him and he does the rest. So back to today, we have various folks sharing about an aspect of God's character and how they've experienced it personally in their lives. We also have a reading today by Terry, Psalm 139, which shows us how God loves us completely. And then Steve's bringing our word today, exploring who is God. Most people focus on God and Jesus, but we should all also remember the Holy Spirit, who is also part of the Trinity. He is our helper. Jesus said, but the counsellor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. So if you are struggling with anything, remember to ask the Holy Spirit for help. Oh, wow. Amazing. And we do appreciate that some of this, you know, or none of this, um, of what you hear may mean make no sense to some of you. And, you know, that's fine too. Um but we do ask, if you can't sit through all of our service today, that we encourage you to jump to the end um, where Claire will be talking um, about relating to that feeling and offer you help. Okay, so before we begin, let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. It's always so good and always enriches us. We pray as people share this morning, you will be amidst us. Mm. with your Holy Spirit making the words touch our hearts and minds. May you open our eyes to see all you have for us and will you stir in us what you want us to hear. Everyone here today listening, Lord, maybe needs to hear something just for them. Mm. Will you do that for us, Lord, as we come together in your name? Amen. Amen. Turning lives around 
our Heavenly Father and he speaks to us when we read the Bible. So I know he cares and has a plan for my life. Um, I don't always understand it and it can seem like a terrible plan when life's painful or as bad as a box of frogs, but uh, um, I know that God is good and because he cares one way or another, I know that uh, everything will be all right in the end. And if it's not all right, it's not the end because I know where it's headed, uh, heaven. So I can rest easy in that. What do you know about God? Um, I know he always looks after us and watches over us. I really like the idea of God as a rock, um, which isn't something I've just made up. It's something he's described as quite a few times in the Bible. Um, I think of him as a rock, a massive rock sticking out of the sea. Um, and however stormy the water is, however difficult things are, he's just always there, really dependable and never changes. And I also really like the idea of him being unchanging and that we can read the Bible and he's exactly the same um, as he was then, thousands of years ago, and as he will be in the future as well. God to me is my friend and my counsellor. So we often talk about uh, God's grace and how much God loves us, but I find it really helpful to remember that God actually likes me as well, likes me like a friend. And as my counsellor, I always have somebody to go to if I have problems that I need to talk to somebody about. Um, so God's attributes, so many. I think the ones that come to mind particularly are kindness, that God is so merciful and kind and compassionate. And that's who he declares he is in Exodus when um, Moses, in, Moses is in the cleft of the rock and he passes, God passes by and he declares that he is the God that is slow to anger, compassionate, merciful, abounding in loving kindness. And um that isn't the attributes that is to, has been totally undoing in my life, really. When you meet the kindness and compassion of God, it completely um, almost breaks your heart in so many ways. Um, and I think the other thing I just want to say quickly, that's part of that God is totally non-shaming. And we live in a society that is very shame-based because we're performance orientated. But God is utterly non-shaming. And that is quite amazing. Um, so, yeah, those are the things that mean a lot to me. Lord, you have examined me. You know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. Even from far away, you comprehend my plans. You study my travelling and resting. You are thoroughly familiar with all my ways. There isn't a word on my tongue, Lord, that you don't already know completely. You surround me front and back. You put your hand on me. That kind of knowledge is too much for me. It's so high above me that I can't fathom it. Where could I go to get away from your spirit? Where could I go to escape your presence? If I went up to heaven, you would be there. If I went down to the grave, you would be there too. If I could fly on the wings of dawn, stopping to rest only on the far side of the ocean, even there your hand would guide me. Even there your strong hand would hold me tight. If I said, the darkness will definitely hide me, the light will become night around me, even then the darkness isn't too dark for you. Nighttime would shine bright as day, because darkness is the same as light to you. You are the one who created my innermost parts. You knit me together while I was still in my mother's womb. I give thanks to you that I was marvellously set apart. Your works are wonderful, I know that very well. My bones weren't hidden from you when I was being put together in a secret place, when I was being woven together in the deep parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my embryo, and on your scroll every day was written that was being formed for me, before any one of them had yet happened. God, your plans are incomprehensible to me. Their total number is countless. If I tried to count them, they outnumber grains of sand. If I came to the very end, I'd still be with you. If only, God, you would kill the wicked. If only murderers would get away from me. The people who talk about you, but only for wicked schemes. The people who are your enemies, who use your name as if it were of no significance. Don't I hate everyone who hates you? Don't I despise those who attack you? Yes, I hate them, through and through. They've become my enemies too. 
Examine me, Lord, look at my heart, put me to the test, know my anxious thoughts, look to see if there is any idolatrous way in me, then lead me on the eternal path. Well, good morning, Junction One Church. Uh, before I start our, and share our message this morning, I just want to begin by recognising that this has been a tough week. There's been so much sadness in our nation, uh, as we saw the number of people who have died with coronavirus go past 100,000. Many of you who are listening uh, may be feeling the weight of this sadness. You may be struggling with the day-to-day -day consequences of the pandemic, either at work or at home. And it's in this context that we gather together this morning. But I want to say that God has a message for us. <clears throat> it's a message that's not less relevant because of all these things, but it's actually even more relevant. It's a word of hope and love. You know, last week we were hearing from Paul Mallard and he reminded us that the Bible is actually God's love letter to us. And so as we gather, and I know that we're in different places, but as we gather to hear God speak to us, then we need to be ready to respond. On this series that we're looking at at the moment, it's called On the Rock. We're seeing how we can build our lives on a foundation that is secure. Remember, we began the story with the wise and foolish builders and what happened when the storm and the floods came. Jesus said that the, it was the wise man whose house stood firm and he was the one who listened to his words and did them. So today we have a really big topic, and actually that's a huge understatement because my message this morning is called, What is God Like? Wow. Firstly, a big thank you to the folk who shared with us their experience of what God is like in those little videos that we saw. I loved watching and listening to them. They're absolutely brilliant. And the great thing is that you can go back and you can listen again. Thank you also to Ruth for our reading in Psalm 139. If you think of the Psalms like a treasure chest, then Psalm 139 is like a fantastic diamond that sparkles and shines. So just before we begin, I'm going to pray. Lord, we want to pray that you'd be with us today, that you'd help us to hear what you say and help us, Lord, as well to respond to what you say. So what is God like? Well, it was a while ago that my wife took our three daughters, we had three daughters then, on a trip to Solihull. The reason for the trip was that the Queen of England was going to be there to take part in the grand opening of the Touchwood Centre. That morning, I got up and I got ready to go to work. And Rachel got up and got ready to, meet, to see the Queen. She spent some time getting herself looking as good as possible she washed her hair, put on her lipstick, and the children, of course, they had to wash their hair and they had to put on their very best dresses. I'm not sure what Rachel really expected. She is an optimist, so maybe she was thinking that the Queen would spot the little Dunster family, come over and say, hello, why not come and visit me in Windsor when you have time? Well, as it turned out, the police kept the crowds well back and all they managed was a distant glimpse as she passed by. However, one of my f uh, parents' favourite photographs was taken in Jersey. My dad's civil engineering company had just finished building a new harbour. And again, the Queen was coming, this time to officially open the harbour. Instead of being with the crowd, the photo records that my mum and dad were there meeting and being introduced to the Queen. My dad simply answered her question about how long the building work had taken, but my mum went on to ask the Queen a question back. And they never forgot that meeting with the Queen. However, I suspect that uh, maybe she forgot uh, about that meeting quite quickly. You see, there's a difference between knowing someone from a distance and really knowing them. Who really knows the Queen and is known by her? Well, I guess it's her family and it's her close friends. Because you see, really knowing someone means that there is a relationship between them. It is possible to know about God, but the Bible tells us that it is much more important to know him than to simply know about him. 
I want to say it really is possible to know God and for God to know us. We can know God and we can know him closely. In fact, God made us for this very purpose. And until we know him, we will never have life as it is really meant to be. It's important to start, though, by reminding ourselves that firstly, we cannot know God fully. You see, God is so great and so majestic that we can never know everything about God. It's impossible for us to know everything about him. This morning, I'm more than completely overawed as I think about the topic upon which I'm talking. However, we can't know God fully, but however, we can know God truly. We can know him in a real way and a meaningful way, not just about him, but really know him. See, Jesus said in the New Testament, he said that this is life eternal, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. The very best thing that can happen to you or to me is that we get to know God. It changes everything. The first thing that we need to know about God, really, is that God is personal. The Bible begins, you see, with God. The very first words of the Bible are well known. This is the opening line. In the beginning, God created. The Bible, you see, doesn't start out to try and prove that God exists. Instead, it sets out to reveal to us what God is like. And God reveals that he is a person. God is not an idea, a theme or a force, but a real person. In contrast to the other gods, the God of the Bible is the living God. You see, God thinks, he feels, he acts, he cares, he protects and he loves. In the Bible, the Psalms are a great place to learn what God is like. And as we see, Psalm 139 is a great psalm in which David shares his experience of knowing God. I know we've read it already, but I'd love to read it again. If you have a Bible handy, then please find it and follow it as I read. Uh, it's a fantastic psalm. So Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down are acquainted and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. If I could count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God, the men of blood depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. 
Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. What a psalm. In this psalm, David sets out what God is like or if you like his attributes, but they're in a way that really matters and makes a difference to him. They're not theoretical facts, but things that really genuinely matter. He considers or meditates on God and his attributes. And we get a sense as we read it that this is his personal theology. He's not relating secondhand experiences and ideas. Instead, he is speaking back to God what God has shown him. The personal theology, the knowledge and meditation on God in this psalm is the very essence of worship. You will see that David keeps breaking into praise. He finds himself taken up with his love and adoration for the God whom he has come to know. To help us look at this psalm, we're going to do it in, in three sections. We're going to take it into three sections and look at what they tell us about God. First of all, we're going to see in verses one to six that God is all knowing or omniscient. And then in verses seven to 12, that God is all present or omnipresent. And then in verses 13 to 18, we're going to see that God is all powerful, omnipotent. So the first six verses, God knows everything. So these verses in the Psalms are about how God is all knowing. God sees and knows everything. This truth about God is not just stated as an abstract fact, like I've just done. Instead, David makes it a personal confession. He describes his experience and he applies it to himself and his own life. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me, he says. God's knowledge is perfect. He doesn't just know about us, but he knows us. That means he knows what we have done. He knows what we're doing and he knows what we will do. He knows what we've said, what we're saying and what we will say. And he even knows what we've thought, what we're thinking and what we will think. Look at these uh, verses in these first uh, section. Verse two says, you know, when I sit down and rise up, that was his doing. You discern my thoughts from afar. What David was thinking, even before a word is on my tongue, it's known to you. That's what David is speaking. How does God knowing everything make us feel? It's easy perhaps to like the idea that God knows everything about someone else. It can even give us perhaps a sense of smugness, but God knowing everything about us, it might make us feel, well, uncomfortable. Hold on, I'm not sure I like that. For the Psalmist though, God's searching and knowing him, it's not a threat, it's a refuge. You see, when we realize that God knows everything about us and he still loves us, that is liberating. A powerful way to express this in our own performance-based culture it is, to, is to say this, and I often say this to myself, you know, there is nothing that I can do to make God love me more, and there is nothing that I can do that will make God love me less. Now you can fix our minds on this, that God loves us, God loves you, and he loves you no matter what. Far from being a threat or a cause of despair, God's all knowledge is our refuge and our comfort. So how does David respond? Well, in verse six, he calls out, he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high, I can't attain it. You see, his response is worship to worship the God who knows him. So the second thing about God is that he is everywhere. So David began the psalm, you see, by realizing and considering that God knows everything about him. And as we said, our first thought or reaction faced with that fact might be uh, that we have an all-knowing God, maybe that we want to escape or to hide. That's perhaps why David thought moved on to the next part. And he considered that God is everywhere. In verse seven, he says, where shall I go from your spirit? In this section of the psalm, David considers and he meditates on the second important thing for us to understand. And that is that God is everywhere. 
I don't think that David really is thinking about hiding or running away from God. Instead, he is considering that wherever he goes or ends up, God will be there and God will be with him. David also knows uh, what he himself is like. He knows that he's prone to wander and even to turn away from God. But he knows that wherever he goes, God is going to be there and he will be with him. Now, he illustrates this in three ways, or he develops it in three ways. In verse eight, he talks about going up or going down, going up to heaven or down to hell. He says, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. Now, that's not surprising because I guess everybody would say, yes, God's in heaven. But David is saying this because the very next thing that he says is kind of incredible. He says that if I take my bed in hell, if I go to Sheol in hell, you are there. If I go to hell, you're there. Hold on. That doesn't make sense. I thought God was in heaven and the devil was in hell. But David is saying that God is everywhere. There is nowhere where God is not. And the next thing he says is that we could go to the east or to the west in verse nine. Um, Though I take the wings of the morning. Now, that's where the sun rises and it's in the east. Or he says, I might go to dwell in the utmost parts of the sea. Now, where David was living was in Israel and to the west was the Mediterranean Sea. Now, these ways of describing distance from which David might end up are really, they're without measure. You can keep going east forever and you can keep going west forever, but you will never get to a place outside of the presence of God. And thirdly, he says, light and darkness. Darkness and light are the same to you. Well, do you detect that David is convinced that there is nowhere that you can go where God is not present? Let me give you one more illustration, this time from the life of Corrie ten Boom. If you've not read the book, The Hiding Place, then you must. In the book, Corrie describes her experience when she and her sister were transported from Holland to Ravensbrück, the concentration and extermination camp in Germany. A small but growing group of women would meet in a flea-ridden bunkhouse, so filthy that none of the guards would enter. Every evening, Corrie and Betsy, they would open a Bible that they'd sneaked in and read it aloud, waiting as then different voices would translate those words into German or Polish or French. And in the book, she writes this. Like waifs clustered around a blazing fire, we gathered about it holding out our hearts to its warmth and light. The blacker the night around us grew, the brighter and truer and more beautiful burned the word of God. I looked about us as Betsy read, watching the light leap from face to face. We are more than conquerors in Romans. It was not a wish, it was a fact. We knew it, we experienced it minute by minute, poor, hated, hungry, We were more than conquerors. Not we shall be, but we are. Wow, what incredible words. You see, God is everywhere, even in Ravensbrook, with his people there. Do we know and do we sense his presence? Third thing, God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. So we've seen that God's all-knowing and all that he's all-present, all that his presence is everywhere. The next part of the psalm, from verses 13 to 18, he brings a third great attribute of God to us, that God is powerful. Now, David really personalises this great truth about God. He is writing from his head, but he's also writing from his heart. Now, probably most of the people around him would acknowledge that God was or God is the creator. But David says not only that he is the creator, David says that he is my creator. He says he made me. Verse 13, you formed my inward parts. That's the innermost being. And this means his soul. The creation of a new human being or a new life begins with the soul. This is our founding identity. David sees that he was a person even when he was in the womb. Every baby in the womb is a work of God. And it is a great mystery. You know, just before uh, coming to speak and to give this message, uh, someone uh, uh, showed me uh, through the computer a photo of their new uh, born granddaughter just a few minutes after being born. 
And uh, I've still got that wonderful picture or image in my mind. Being wonderfully made, as it says in verse 14, acknowledges that we don't really understand how this is possible. Now, I don't know if someone has called you wonderful today, but you are. And that's because God has made you wonderful. God not only made David, but he even made the days for David in his life. Verse 17, in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Wow, this really is an all-powerful God. He creates us and the days for us, and they're written, every one of them. This is like uh, God keeps a diary of everything that will happen. You and I, we have to, uh, if we want to have a diary, we have to fill a diary in at the end of the day. But God fills it in before any of the days are made. David gets blown away again as these things by God's spirit are brought to him. And in verse 17, he says, how precious to me are your thoughts. If I could count them, they're more than the sand. So this psalm really brings to us a sense that there is a close relationship with God. There's no doubt as we read it, we get an overwhelming feeling that God loves David and David loves God. The next few verses from verse 19, they, they may seem strange to us at first. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, it begins. It seems suddenly like David is speaking out and calling down judgment in a vindictive or mean way. We might think that he suddenly stopped thinking about God altogether. Surely David's wrong to use such incredibly strong words like hate or loathe. Perhaps we could imagine someone saying, well, I like the psalm up to this bit. I like the first part, but hey, hold on. But you know, these are important verses. David's passion and love for God is displayed in his genuine anger. Who is David? Who is it that David is saying that he hates? He's not complaining against those who speak against himself, against his own enemies, who take his own name in vain or hate him or rebel against his kingdom. No, actually, he's speaking against those who speak against God maliciously, who take God's name in vain, who hate God, who are rebelling against God. You know, if we see people who do this against God and we say, well, it doesn't matter, who cares? It reveals that our love to God is rather cold and maybe just academic. You see, we cannot just disagree with them. It hurts us so much that we might even get to the point where it makes it impossible for us to be with them. David is not saying this because he's better than them. He's saying this because he loves God. He finishes this part by saying that he counts these people his enemies. And we move towards the end of the psalm in the very uh, last verse. Uh, David knows uh, that he's far from perfect. In his words and his thoughts and his actions, well, they all fall far short of what they should be. The message version for the ending of this psalm reads, Investigate my life, O God. Find out everything about me. See for yourself whether I've done anything wrong. Then guide me on the road to eternal life. David finishes the psalm with a prayer that the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful God will know him and will lead him in the way everlasting. How do we come to know God and be known by God? It's through his son, Jesus. Jesus is the one who brings us into God's presence. Through Jesus, we know him. And through Jesus, we have new power to live a life alongside him. When we believe in Jesus, we are brought into God's family and we will have everlasting blessings and life eternal. Praise his name. Lord, thank you for this great psalm. We pray that our knowledge of you wouldn't be about you. It will be that we know you. And Lord, we say just like David says, Search me and know me, O Lord, and lead me in the ways that are everlasting. Amen.
Thanks for joining us today. If what you've heard uh, leaves you with questions, then you're in good company because we've all got our own questions and we've all been on our own journey of getting to know Christ. So if you want to know more, then please do get in touch. We'd love to chat. So welcome back. We really pray God has been speaking to you this morning and that he will continue to do so during the week. So shall we pray? Yeah. Lord God, our Father, how truly amazing you are. The more we learn about you, Lord, the more we are astounded at your love for us. Father, we pray that we don't just hear it, but we really experience it and believe it. 
Lord, help us make time for you in our busy lives as you, the great I am, have so much to say to us, so much love you want to lavish on us, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit will hover over us, pouring your love into our lives. That is an amazing vision, but that's what you promise us, Lord, and we want to experience it every day of our lives. So, Father, as we look ahead to another week, we pray that you will be with us and that the Holy Spirit will guide us and protect us. Amen. 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 You know, there are so many facets of God and we have so much to learn about him, some of which we will do during this series on Who is God? Mm -hmm. He is so powerful and we look forward to hearing more about him. But in the meantime, as always, if you'd like to talk or connect with us, then please do. We always love hearing from you. It's our usual address, info at junction1.org. We can promise you that someone kind and lovely and understanding will want to talk to you. Yes, definitely. We look forward to having you with us next week, um, if you possibly can. Um, but till then, uh, have a great week. Thank you. Bye.